Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, very good. Thank you. Thank you, Yuli. I, I just want to say thank you so much to everybody this evening, and thank you to the Society, to the Foundation, Innovator MD, our, uh, our, our technical crew. Yuli, what an amazing honor. I mean, thank you so much. And I met your co-founder as well, and so thank you so much. And, and so, so literally, I, I came in, uh, and the first couple of people I was meeting uh, here in the room are just, you guys are ridiculously smarter, absolutely humbling you know, in comparison. And so I'm honored to be here. I, I wanted to tell you just a brief uh, story about sort of my, my journey. I mean, that's, that's the, this is sort of the basic intro. But uh, so I, I was born in New York City and, and you know, first, uh, first generation immigrants to America. So they're uh, Turkish uh, and so living in America not speaking Turkish that much in the house, right? So we're learning English, I mean, they, they, they learning, learned English, and we're speaking English in America. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, this was in, in New York City, I was born with a congenital defect, right? So, so the uh, malformation of my hip, the absence of a lower limb, you know, and needed a prosthesis, right? So from the very first moment of being able to learn how to walk, need a prosthesis, and every year after that. Uh, so going through that medical journey of de durable medical equipment. But, uh, and then at age 11 and a half, 12, my parents decided to retire and move to Istanbul. So now I'm going to Istanbul, already used to Saturday morning cartoons in America, and then this was in the, in the you know, early 90s, to going to Turkey, where at the time there really only was one, maybe two government channels. Now, now it's significantly uh, more child-friendly in terms of cartoons. Uh, but, but that sort of journey uh, led me to then uh, sort of essentially form who I am today. And so I, I uh, did medical school. I did psychoanalytic training as well. I'm a Freudian nerd, but that might not be applicable to, to here today. But, uh, and I, I got the opportunity to uh, in the Bronx, uh, oversee and become the medical director uh, as Montefiore Medical Center was taking over uh, Our Lady of Mercy and the operations there. And so very, very early on, uh, at the onset essentially of my, of my professional career as a very, very young attending, uh, got into a senior leadership position. And so uh, then a couple years ago at this point, I was asked to uh, and invited and, and recruited to come to Kaiser. And I was the medical director for hospital operations in, in South Sacramento. Uh, and then recently I, I joined the uh, Hospital Health Plan, the foundation, as the executive director. And, and now I oversee 21 uh, hospitals and, and a little over 4.2 4 million lives. And so that's the, the, the fun part of, of sort of the, the you know, after effect of, of this journey and sort of a little bit of, of how I came here. Uh, this is a very you know, long slide deck and I can go in and out sort of, of, of detail as, as needed. But uh, typically, I, I, this is my shameless plug. I, you know, it's just this is. Uh, so I, I started writing this book a couple of years ago, uh, and, and it just came out a couple a couple weeks ago. Uh, and, and it got, uh, I mean, it's an esoteric subject. And who cares about emergency psychiatry except for the emergency doctors and the psychiatrists? There's a couple of you guys here. Uh, but but the 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 uh, interest that it's uh, rec you know, been recognized for, uh, even in the last couple uh, weeks now, uh, as you know, being number one new release on emergency medicine, within business and money, psychiatry, et cetera, is really the, this sort of this journey, the personal journey, and, and the way I wrote it with my friends, the reason why I wrote this was, we were in a previous administration in America, and, I, and at that time I was cautiously optimistic about the future. Now I'm, I'm more cautiously optimistic about the future. But uh, this isn't a political talk, but the, 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 the sort of the, where this resonates really is, uh, you know, I wrote it, we wrote it the way I, I talk, the way I think, and the way I come across, and the way I want to come across to my patients when I'm hustling, seeing thousands and thousands of patients in the ER, uh, and I want other people to experience the healthcare journey itself. And so, uh, uh, you, know, the, the, you know, having seen and heard the different innovations, that, you know, the companies that you work for, the, you know, the amazing Mabu, I mean, that's absolutely wild. Claimly, I'm definitely going to, you know, uh, hook up with you later, uh, you know, and, and try to figure out what, what can be done, and, and, and these ideas, and this is my first first soap uh, in-person meeting. I, I was lurking before, but, but Yuli had coffee with me and he said, you know, you got you to come. And so I, I plan to be a, a coming a little bit more often. But uh, I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much for, for having me. Current state, right? Mental health parity, right? Why, why don't people, why haven't people typically gone into psychiatry? Wasn't it, why wasn't, hasn't it been more, uh, garnered more interest? That's one piece. We finally have parity in America right now. 
The other sort of piece on the other end of the spectrum that I want people to sort of be mindful of is uh, in about five or so years, 50% of my colleagues who are psychiatrists, right, medical doctor trained psychiatrists, uh, are going to be retirement age. And people still aren't going into that at that level of, of, uh, of intensity in terms of getting into psychiatry in terms of residency training. So you've got, that's the backdrop. We have finally reached parity in terms of, and basically parity is being paid at the same level as or reimbursed at the same level for, as you would for other medical care. Uh, we, you know, subsequently the, the Addiction Equity Act uh, and the Affordable Care Act. And so the reason why I bring these up is you now have this widespread understanding of what's available, what I can ask for. So I'm a patient, I'm coming in, what I can ask for as a patient, what is available. You have a dramatically in, dramatic increase in the number of patients and people seeking mental health care. The backdrop of people not going in to, uh, to be able to become clinicians to do this kind of work and a decrease in services on county and, and statewide levels. So public funding for this continues to decrease. Uh, so what, what, you know, what, what's going to happen? How are we gonna solve this issue? And uh, I was just talking earlier with the, with the people that I, that I met just uh, uh, in the meet and greet earlier that WHO has recognized that depression is the leading cause of illness burden worldwide period, end of story, surpassing all the other illnesses that you can imagine, right? And so couple that with the understanding that we still have, even though there's an increased need and increased demand for psychiatric, psychological, mental health, wellness, whatever you want to term it, services, you have this uh, paucity and a decrease in people going into it and services being actually created to, 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 to sort of remedy this and, and help people, uh, and you've got this, this gap. We also know that Every one dollar spent for depression or anxiety treatment yields a four dollar return in terms of health, productivity, and, and work, uh, you know, in terms of being able to have gainful employment. So that's the, uh, that's the backdrop, that's sort of to pique to peak your guys' interest, especially if you're thinking of it from a dollars and cents perspective, but also from a global illness and, and burden, and, and, and Samsung wants to create uh, better lives for everybody, and, and obviously as, as do we all, which is why so many people here are using terms such as wellness and psychology and being able to connect with folks, because it's real. Uh, and, and that's why I'm, I'm glad that, Yuli, you invited me because it's just now I feel like I'm, I'm fitting in. Uh, so case example, right? So this is the you know, busiest emergency department in Sacramento. This is the one that they, they asked me to come out to and, and uh, uh, you know, it was the operations, the hospital operations uh, director there. Uh, and I was the sole psychiatrist full-time in the ED there. That's my job. And so full-time, all the time there, all day, every single day. Uh, this was in 2014, but the impetus for this case example, which is N of one, and now it's certainly increased uh, in terms of the scale and, and what we're doing. But at the time, uh, you've got uh, you know, mixed uh, pair uh, mix, you've got level two trauma center, teaching center, over 130,000 visits in uh, essentially 41 ED bays. So you've got large, you know, high volume patients uh, coming in, it's a teaching center, one of the best performing emergency departments in the country and therefore the world. Constant improvement, constant innovation. Uh, and uh, they noticed, we noticed at the time, the reason why you know, I, I came out and, and joined Kaiser uh, it was the care for the behavioral health patients throughout the system. And this wasn't specific to that organization, but throughout the system was lacking. And, and you'll, you'll likely find that, that it, as it's getting better, it still needs continuous improvement. And so. In, just in Sacramento, the county hospital uh, had closed uh, their, their crisis unit and, and, and shut down 50% of their inpatient psychiatric beds. You know, Yuli mentioned I'm an operations guy. This is like operations 101. You've cut increased demand, decreased supply, et cetera, et cetera. The disaster, as you can imagine, then results in sort of the bottleneck of, of uh, patients being essentially stuck in the ER waiting for a place to go. Uh, and this is, you know, this is, so I, I joined in, in 14, you're seeing the, the dramatic increase uh, as it related to, you know, direct uh, result of what was going on locally in, in this case example. And this was sort of the, the previous model. This patient comes in with a behavioral health complaint, uh, the ED doctor first sees them, then plus minus, is it a psychiatric issue? Yes, then we need to get medical you know, labs to figure out what are we gonna do with this patient, any kind of quote unquote medical clearance. 
right, which can result in hours and hours and hours of negotiation just for somebody to actually pee into a cup so they can get the urine toxicology, let alone wait for the laboratory result to come back to interpret it. And the ED docs are, are smiling sadly, you know, this sad emoji, uh, you know, where, where then you then, once they're quote unquote medically cleared, then you call the psychiatry team if you're lucky enough to have one. And then the psychiatry team says, oh yeah, they have a psychiatric issue and the ER clinicians are like, well, yeah, that's literally why I called you. Anyway, you go through that whole paperwork and, and try to find the bed. Now you're going into hours, if not days of the patient staying in the emergency room and, and, and technically that's called boarding, but it doesn't matter. They're just stuck somewhere until they need to get out. And so you, you, get, you know, admit, board, they're stuck there versus the, you know, the small percentage that you say, okay, you know what, otherwise you can, you can go to somewhere that's not a hospital. And so, you know, what we did, what we looked at was, um, oh, this is counting up to 30. Okay, thank you, <laughs> sorry. Uh, what, we, what we did was uh, looking very specifically at why not start active treatment in the emergency department, right? Why not make it so that you've got very clear protocolized measures and treatment protocols specific to the illness, the psychiatric illness? And, and this is one of those things where you do this for all the other medical issues. Why is it that if it's psychiatry, you just let them be and you wait for a psychiatry, you know, an inpatient psychiatric bed to open up for you to transfer them, for them to start their care, right? And so that, that sort of was one uh, certainly non-value had in the step, but this whole concept of then, okay, you start treatment, see how they're doing, You've got them anyway, they're, they're captive audience, literally. Their civil liberties, for most part, have been removed by virtue of their psychiatric illness if they're, if they're waiting for a transfer, for the most part, uh, unfortunately, and we're working on that as well. However, you've got them there. You start them on treatment. How about following up? How about continue to reassess them while they're there? Avoid unnecessary testing, right? So what I did was we looked at labs uh, that really add no value to the outcome. Simple things. Like what difference does it make what the urine toxicology shows? Right? As a clinician, you can say, well, the guy's high or he's drunk or he's stoned, or he's not. It doesn't matter if he smoked something yesterday or the day before. And, and, and when it comes positive in the urine toxicology, that makes literally no difference in the outcome of what you're gonna do with the patient in the emergency department. I don't need to tell the ER docs, but the, but the reality is, is that when you look at county and state level cost shifting, you're also looking at uh, inpatient hospitals and clinicians that are sort of stuck in the old way of thinking about things and really also essentially a cost shift as well. And, and, and I would say an, essentially an academic laziness but, uh, as well. And so you've got the avoiding unnecessary testing. And what that does is just think about this whole concept. If it makes no difference, why would you get it? One. Two, you get the lab, but something even as simple as urine takes se several hours, something like the you know, thyroid test, it's a blood test, that doesn't come back for like a day or so, sometimes longer depending on where you are. The patient, hopefully you wanna get them out of the emergency department, but you're waiting for a thyroid test that typically is still on uh, uh, order panels, and the patient's already left, and now the doctor gets it, if you have electronic medical record, the doctor gets the results of the thyroid panel, a day or two after they've already seen the patient, the patient's already out. So what do you do with that information? So we look at all of this in terms of the cost of the test, the, the medical legal liability for the physician who orders these tests, and how often they come up positive or not, and looking at how do we then reduce this? Because uh, even though you remove someone's civil liberties and say, hey, from a psychiatric perspective, you cannot leave the emergency department, you still are unable to have an invasive procedure such as a, 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 a sticking a needle into their arm to get blood or getting urine without them providing it, right? And so that's the other piece too. So not only are you negotiating with the patient trying to say, hey, please pee into this cup, so I can, but it also doesn't add anything and, and it just it, it makes it, the situation even worse. Uh, and then the, the sort of the piece of discharging safely when possible, right? Aligning the goals with, with the patient. And so really sort of the, the vision here basically was and is and, and, and is continuing to build uh, on is making it so that we're reinforcing the, the transitions between points of care, but making it so that we're evolving at the, the, the same pace of care of our patients, of the people that are coming into the emergency department, of the people that are coming into our clinics, that are coming into our hospitals, right? And so 
When you understand the trends that are affecting healthcare going forward, and now and going forward, and, and, and some of you guys are interested in this angle as well, well, I guess most of you, because it's the P stands for something, physician, right? So it's healthcare something, right? In soap, is, is this whole concept of one, patients are understanding a lot more about what, they, what their needs are, what's available, but also are looking at things like cost transparency and what am I buying and what am I actually, what is it worth it or not? That's one piece. The other angle certainly is technology. Most of you guys are, are uh, experts at this and this is literally what you do all day. But then the other piece is sort of the operational concept of if you have this problem, the previous solution was well then just build more hospitals, build more hospital beds, build more of the, in, in, rather than looking upstream and, and these other solutions that we put together. And so this is you know, you know, showing the, the new paradigm, if you will, of what I just described. Uh, and, and now what we were doing then, and, and this is continuing, now you've got the ER doc, so it would be Yuli and I, the ER doc, and the psychiatrist going in together. We're seeing you know, patient, let's say Johnny, for the first time. It's like, hey, Johnny, what's going on? And so we're not getting the same story multiple times. I, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, Yuli's a million times better doctor than I am, so I'm just listening to him. He's listening to the guy's lung, whatever, heart, and then I'm just listening. And then if there's anything I need to chime in on, we already have this relationship. Yuli's making eye contact with me. I'm trying to figure out what we need. So we get all the questions once. I say, hey, listen, you know what? This guy's been on lithium. Why don't you just order a lithium panel? He just does that while we're talking to the patient. We're not wasting any time. And then you've got the clinically indicated labs, and I'll get to that in a moment. You start the treatment right then and there. What's going on? When was the last time you were on the meds? What do you need? Here are the medication. Yuli's ordering them. It's one of the nice things about being a consultant is that the ER docs have no, all the work. No, but, I just, uh, but, but you have to have that relationship. Uh, otherwise, they won't. Uh, and then the ongoing reassessment, saying like, hey, man, listen, we're Johnny, we're going to give you this medication. I'm going to come back to you in a couple hours. And now the patient knows, the person knows, hey, Yuli's and Yener are, are taking care of me, right? I've got this relationship already. If you need anything, just talk to Yener for you know, whatever, neck up, and then talk to you, leave her neck down. Uh, and, and you've got that familiarity, you've got that relationship already. You're instilling hope with the patient saying, hey man, listen, you might not even need to be here. Let's figure out, let's get the information that we need. And our goal is literally the same as your goal, which is to get you out of the emergency department. And that's basic, you know, ED operations, so you just need to get them out. Doesn't matter where they go, you just have to get them out of the ER. Um, and so, the concept then is, uh, you know, admit versus discharge, but then the other angle, which is, you know, the dedicated psychiatric observation areas. Now, if you're a psychiatrist, you're like, well, yeah, you just have, a, you work, you send them to a psychiatric emergency services or a, you know, CPEP equivalent, but majority of emergency departments do not have something like that or immediate access to that. And so that's the subtlety in terms of understanding the, the, the need for this in the majority of the ERs. And so this, uh, the Smart Medical Clearance Form, S-M-A-R-T, uh, I was in, uh, in Vegas uh, with a buddy, uh, he's, uh, he's uh, the, quality, the head of quality at CEP, he's an emergency doc, Seth Thomas. And so we were just at, at this conference and we are just talking, we are like, hey, let's put together this, uh, this, you know, this protocol. So we did this, we put this together, this was Vegas, we came back to uh, Northern California. Uh, and, and we've refined it with the medical society, we validated it and with our friends in UC Davis, uh, as well as through the medical society and, and several pilots. And, uh, essentially, what, what was just a, an idea between lectures uh, with, with Seth Thomas became this medical clearance form. And really what this does is it's, it's, the purpose is multiple. But I want to draw your attention to the very last part, right? Who cares about the to, you know, blood pressure, whatever. Let the doctors think about that. But really this bottom part here, this completed by piece, so simple. So sort of you would almost like not even see this, but really what that's added, and this has been the most valuable, and we put this there intentionally, piece where you say, you know what? The ER doctor is going to go through all of the, the medical labs and all the workup for the patient. They're gonna sign their name here. We're gonna send this to wherever the patient is actually going with the accountability that if there's a problem, I'm going to be the physician responsible because my name literally is on this. And this is a different mindset, especially when you get into the, the idea of the way psychiatrists and inpatient psychiatry works as well. There's, there, currently there's a wall for asking for these kind of labs and really pushing back on patients that might be more ill or might re require different levels of services. But, so that's one piece. The other one then is that, that we sort of thought of, but, but it was one of those aha moments while it was being piloted and, and, and tested and used on in real life cases in multiple, multiple settings was, 
you're, so, so you could look at this from a utilization perspective of saying, hey, let's just decrease labs and get the patient through. But the other side is then you're changing now, essentially we're changing, we changed the way the ED physician and, and nurse is also thinking, the clinician and the ED. So it's not just a psych patient anymore, it's like, oh shoot, if I want to get this patient, a man, woman, whatever, out of the ER, I have to go through this and, oh, I didn't even think of asking about whatever, digoxin or phenytoin or a lab that they might be on that I might need a, a lab value for, or something like, you know what, some of the other abnormalities where it's like, literally it's a hard stop before you can then quote unquote clear the patient. This intervention specifically, right, nowhere do you see urine toxicology, nowhere do you see thyroid, you know, a function test, you know, this intervention results in significant thousands per dollars per patient and, and several hours, sometimes double digit hours in terms of boarding alone just by doing proper evidence-based medicine. Now, the ER doctors know this, they've been fighting this you know, for, for years, why, why hasn't that been socialized? It's this, it's the relationship, it's the understanding, it's also saying, hey, we're in this together. We have to figure out this issue operationally for our patients, for ourselves, so that we can make it so that patients are healthier and the docs and nurses aren't burning out. And the patients are actually saying, you know what, I came for help and I actually am getting the help that I need. Right? So, the, so now, you know, the smartmedicalclearance.org is you know, through the medical side, the, the um, Sierra Sacramento Valley Medical Society, that, you know, the group that I was working with, and now it's on the website. Super proud and excited. You can you know, obviously freely download it. Please use this in the counties that you're in. Um, and and uh, the, the next piece then was with this group that, that you know, I started and, and they continued and, and, and mastered it was the FAST form, the field assessment. You've got non-clinicians in the field, right? They respond to something. How do you then clear somebody and get them to the appropriate level from the street rather than going to the default emergency room or, or some more higher level than they typically would need. So then you've got the field assessment screening test now, and this is being used uh, by mobile crisis service teams and law enforcement. You're diverting inappropriate use and making it so that people who truly have emergency needs are going to the emergency department. And, uh, so, so really, the you know, operational piece is, is what, we, what we looked at, and this is what this slide describes. But, the next piece then is the data set, and, and I'm not going to you know, share, share the, uh, the dashboard that we created, but this is the understanding of the, the continuum, and you have to understand the journey, and that I think more often than not, for the work that I do as a psychiatrist and, and a psychoanalyst, and I, I don't admit that uh, unless, unless directly asked, but you know, as, as someone that understands or tries to understand the human condition from different angles, but also understands how miserable the, the healthcare journey is too. Right? Every couple of years I have to go and buy a miserable new leg and it's a horrible amount of paperwork. I forget cleanly, it's, it's like, it's absolutely bananas just getting a new leg and it's the same technology for the last you know, 30 years for the prosthesis, right? And so understanding the misery of it firsthand, not speaking a language, literally, it's not even a metaphor, going to Turkey, not even speaking the language, understanding what people are saying, and then now being able to say, you know, this is a pretty sort of crappy journey. How can I make this better? How can I connect with the patient and be like, hey man, listen, I'm gonna help you in this. I'm gonna help you figure this out. Talk with the family, talk with the patient. Instill hope, realistic hope, but on that human, human connection. And so understanding the, the, this sort of journey. And so right now, as, as the executive director, I'm, I'm you know, on the, the you know, administrative side over quality and regulatory oversight and the thing that I enjoy the most is not PowerPoints or Excel spreadsheets, which you know, certainly pays the bills, but is, is the aspect of that connection. When a mom, a dad, a patient, a daughter, a son, or somebody in the family calling and saying, hey, you know, how is this, you know, what is this miserable journey like? And that's sort of the cumulative effect of where I said, you know what, I'm gonna put this book together with my buddies. And, and literally the first section of the book is behind the scenes, no jargon, behind the scenes, what it's like to be an ER doc, what it's like to be an ER psychiatrist, what it's like to be an ER social worker, writing from their perspective, and so that you've got uh, uh, hospital administrators and CEOs uh, buying the book and getting very interested in using this because it shows specifically, you know, line by line, how you can actually be profitable in this, in this uh, miserable situation. And you've got patient advocates saying, hey, this is actually the true journey. Uh, and, and one of the big things that, that you know, there certainly is, uh, you know, there, there are curses in the book as well. And, it, and it's sort of certainly very uh, 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 approachable. It's real, right? And th this is sort of what I think is part of the, the reason why it's resonating and, and something as you know, random as emergency psychiatry. And so uh, I talked a little bit about this. And, and the emergency department piece 
itself looking at things like length of stay. Who's responsible for the patient when they're in the emergency department? Is it the ER doctor? Is it the administrator in the ER? Is it the hospital administrator, et cetera? Uh, looking at things like billing by payer mix, right? Looking at things even very specific at time to consultation, right? You, we've got this down in operating rooms procedures. Why isn't it the case in, in some of these others? Um, and then certainly looking at the outpatient, but along the continuum, how do you then keep people accountable and understand what that journey is for, for the patient? Um, and then the inpatient side as well, looking at things like uh, certainly patient satisfaction throughout the spectrum and, and obviously the quality uh, of care. And so when you decrease the need for lab testing, decrease the need for time in the emergency department or going actually to an inpatient unit, you're decreasing costs for the people that are paying for this, right? It's either the patient paying out of pocket or the insurance company or whoever's paying for this. You're making it so that the beds aren't being filled up unnecessarily or, or, or the opposite way of looking at it is the patients who really need to be in the hospital are in the hospital. You're opening up the, the throughput and you're making it so that the patient themselves are understanding and feeling more satisfied all the while, the doctor, the nurse, the sort of the unsung heroes of this journey are also like, hey, you know what, I'm actually making a difference in these people's lives at their you know, crappiest parts of their day or, or week, and I'm actually making a difference, and you're, you're essentially making it, uh, who said this, uh, immune to burnout, right? I, I won't go that far, but making it so that you're feeling a lot more satisfaction in your job. And so, uh, you know, in, in so I, I came to California in March, and this is just me, uh, and I saw 3,500 patients that year, 10% drop, just me. And I still went home, and I, cause I had a, you know, I still have a kid, but he was younger a couple years ago. And, and so, I, you know, he was, how old was he? Two, two and a half, so I wanted to go home. So I had a very clear agenda. I'm gonna get out of this emergency room. I was the only guy there, so anybody that I didn't see, I didn't take care of, essentially would be there the next day. Uh, so I had that uh, on me, and we had cross coverage, et cetera. But this is really the effect of one person, one intervention, and now we're scaling this uh, throughout uh, with, with this model. And so, and this is sustained, and it's actually dropping. And, and I'm just giving you 2014 numbers because I don't, I don't want to give you any other numbers, but the realistically, you just have to understand that this is sustaining. And, and there's, no, uh, there's no reason for this ever to go backwards. And so, what is, what is an admission? What's the average length of stay in an inpatient psychiatric hospital? Mike? Yeah, I mean, it's, that's a little high, but let's say 10, uh, average 10, about, right? And so what's the average amount of money for one night in an inpatient psych hospital? Like three, four, maybe, maybe a little less, right? So times 10, times whatever, my salary wasn't several million dollars, it really was, it still isn't. I mean, and it'll probably never be a salary of that money. But, but when you're looking at that, and that wasn't never the goal. The goal never was, hey, you never make money for the hospital. It was like, just do what's right for the patient. And you're like, oh, okay. And, and sort of with, with the idea, with the empathy, with being able to understand this and this. And this, is, this was, you know, I think, conservative. If you hustle and you've got several people on this, which we do now, looking at this a lot more carefully, the, the, the gains are, are significantly more. And so. The, the implications really are, you know, looking at, and we've got, you know, statistical models of, of you know, throughout the, uh, throughout the spectrum, throughout the days, staffing certainly to demand, but also understanding what a, uh, a you know, even a small number, net number of new patients with a long tail ends up being in terms of the, the flow of the patients. And, you know, you end up being, as, you know, let's say the emergency psychiatrist or team that, that's helping them out, the number one fan, uh, the, sorry, the ER team ends up being your number one fan because you're getting the patients out. The ER doctors go to, you know, ER school or, you know, what are training to, to take care of, like, you know, the guy's got an ax in his head and he wants to take care of that. He doesn't want to take care of somebody that's crying and, 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 and it's going to take three hours to talk about their feelings. That's what I went to school for. I love that. I, I eat that up. I love it, love it so much. And the sicker and, and the more complicated, the better for me. But the ER doc's like, oh my God, I just want to do a tr two traumas and whatever. And so that's sort of the piece. And you have to understand that as well and, and be in that vibe so that you can uh, uh, sort of play off of one another and all succeed. And so uh, I just want to go into so some of the creative solutions, right? I talked about the dedicated psychiatric observation area, smart medical clearance form, the FAST form. Uh, I, I, I co-created the Emergency Psychiatry Fellowship. Uh, and, and this is specifically for 
ER docs, certainly psychiatrists uh, you know, as interested can join, but this is really to make it so that the ER clinicians have this understanding. And, and again, shameless plug for my book, but it's called Emergency Department Psychiatry, right? I'm an emergency psychiatrist, but the, this, the, the, the goal of all of this work, the goal of, and the purpose of all this is to make it so that the ER clinicians have that level of expertise, so you know essentially what you need to do. Um, and the patient and, and certainly the administrators know what to expect of, of the clinicians in, in the ERs. And I mean, just, just look up this, back of the napkin calculations, look, decreased admission rate, decreased nursing and security hours in the emergency department, decreased lab tests ordered, and, and certainly cost conscious treatment in terms of the medications that you order, which is a, a whole nother talk in and of itself. Um, impact on quality, what does this mean, right? You've got, uh, immediate alleviation of symptoms. Well, think about that. That's, that's a wild sort of idea. Uh, and you've got the co improved collaboration. And Yuli's like, hey, man, let's get coffee. And then it turns into like, hey, let's get a beer. And hey, let me introduce you to the wife and the kids and whatever. And so you've got that collaboration. So that come tomorrow, when it's like, hey, should I do a full consult with you or a curbside? He's going to trust my judgment, et cetera, et cetera. And this makes sense if you're in the field. But it's not that robotic sort of sterile, uh, just look something up and get the answer piece that uh, we would like. But you still need that collaboration and the relationship. Decreased medical legal. You've got a thyroid function test that's sitting in your inbox three days later after the guy's left, you don't even remember what the guy's name was, and it's positive or not positive. What do you even do with that information? Well, how you, what hospital did that guy even go to it's for you to then call and say, hey, the thyroid is a little out of whack, and what effect does that even have, right? And that's a very simple example, but understanding how that changes that dynamic as well, let alone sticking a catheter into a woman who doesn't want to pee on her own to get the urine because you have to because the door is blocked there and you need to get them uh, screened. And so, uh, and then you've got the least restrictive uh, modality of, of care provided and that's human centric. That's what I would want, that's what I would want for my mom, that's what I want for my kid and that's what I would want for, for all of us. And so, um, you know, this is, gets more into sort of the, the operations of, of the rounding and I created this. Literally, I just I wrote this and it's posted on the ERs and you can take it, it's part of the book, you can use it for however you want. What is this? This is like, hey man, this is your journey. These are the things that I might need from you as a doctor and this is how you're gonna get out. It's like red, yellow, green. I, just, I want you to get out of the emergency department. Right? I don't get any more or less money by hospitalizing you. I don't get any more or less sort of accolades for one thing or another. I have the same goal as you. I want you to get out of the emergency department, obviously safely. Um, and, and patients respond. They're like, oh, oh, you need to call my mom, lover, boyfriend, whoever, to get the information for you to get out? Oh, okay, cool. And you'll be surprised how often patients all of a sudden now remember a phone number that they were telling you that they forgot before. But I'm like, dude, if I call and I collab corroborate your story, I'm gonna get you out. And they're like, oh, oh, the phone number's da 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 da. And now everybody's an expert at remembering phone numbers when before they didn't want to because they didn't trust me and they didn't trust the system because of their previous experiences. Um, and the safety and planning is, is sort of a, a, a minutia, but it's important in terms of you know, the work that, that, that we do. Um, and again, shameless plug. So guys, thank you, thank you so much. It's 31 minutes, I took a little bit more of your time, but thank you, thank you. So questions, questions, thoughts, regrets? Yes? So the question is, is smart form in the EMR? So I guess it depends on, on which EMR you're talking about, but not, not right now, but it should be, right? Because, you know, and, and the reason why uh, is you need agreement with the accepting facilities as well. And so think about sort of that dynamic uh, in that sense. And so uh, that's certainly the goal, to make it as easy to use as possible, but right now it's, it's not. But you can put it in yeah, 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 I mean, it's... No, I mean, the difference between putting an attachment seat from a PDF versus actually having those fields together. Yeah, you can do that, though. I mean, both that are concerned. Yeah. That's a topic next Yeah, yeah, I'm going to learn code, how to code the EMR, right? No. Uh, any other thoughts? Is, was this helpful? Did it resonate at all? I mean, is this something that's, that's interesting? I mean, I'll, I'll definitely stick around. I want to do, who's, somebody had an app that they were interested in. Oh, you, you need ear fluid. I don't have ear fluid. Uh, no, yeah, sorry, sorry. I've got a five-year-old, though. He had two ear infections in the last year, so I could squeeze him a little. Yeah, sorry. You showed a lot about operational Yeah. Yeah. So which, which part of the hospital wouldn't uh, the, everybody want the patient to leave? 
So the question was, so, you, in, so I'm sorry, let me just repeat the question. So the question is, uh, it makes sense in an ED setting, you, you know, everybody wants the patient to get out of the ED. Uh, what about other parts of the hospital, outpatient, inpatient as well? You, you know, here's the thing. The, the sentiment is, is sort of the theme of what I was talking about in terms of understanding the continuum. I think the, the, the operations of, of discharge, you know, it's certainly applicable on the inpatient. And when you see the, the heaviest sort of bottlenecks in terms of cost, but also, you know, not being able to get patients to where they need to go, uh, those are the ones where it's most applicable. But certainly on an outpatient level, you, you know, we're switch shifting it upstream so that you have the accountability so the patients don't end up in the emergency department. So you can say, hey, Yuli, I sent the guy to the clinic, like, uh, Last week, why is the guy back in the emergency department? And he's going to pick up my phone next time I call him because he knows that I'm not going to call him for nothing. It's that relationship as well. And it doesn't necessarily have to be, certainly help more helpful in integrated systems, but you, we're seeing this happening in county systems as well, adopting the smart mail clearance form as well. And so uh, it, it, this is one of those interesting uh, pieces, and it sounds cheesy, but it's like win, win, win. Like you can make money off of this, save money off of this, patients get better, clinicians like it. I guess it's a win, 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 whatever. Anyway, yeah, go ahead. So, so the question to paraphrase is, is discharge planning an appropriate sort of community resources and, and matching that? You know, this is what we're trying to do, but I mean, right now we're at a point, and this might spark some ideas in, in the entrepreneurs here, is, is uh, you know, we're doing paper pencil, seriously, and fax, like yeah. literally, right? And, yeah, I, I, like I want to go home and play, play with my kid. You know, I don't know, I've got, got to, not, not enough hours, you know. But no, certainly, you, we need that, obviously. Wouldn't it be cool if I had like the iPad and be like, oh, where are you? And you just click here and it zooms in and you say, hey, go to this clinic or go to, the, of course, I would love that. Yes, yeah. That's, that's the job of the entrepreneurs. That's, yeah, the, the, the E of the soap. Yeah, I'm just the P. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for having me.